is preparing. Okay, we are live. Welcome, 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 Facebook community. You know how I do this. I'm about to have this dynamic. Live. Welcome, 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 Facebook community. Jesus, let me just share it to my personal page. I know this happens every single time I get ready to share. Here we go. Watch my live interview. And I'll try to tag you, uh, Patasha. Let's see if it allows me to tag you. Okay. Mm -mm. I don't know why I can tag sometimes and sometimes I can't. But it's not allowing me to tag you, so I'm just gonna share it, and you can grab it. Let me gotcha. It. All right, all right, all right. Okay, community. Okay, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Y'all in for a treat here. I'm gonna do my best to take notes and summarize, but I'm just telling you now: grab your notebooks, your pen. <laughs> because I'm not going to be able to summarize and you'll just have to catch the replay. So here we go. Welcome, 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 friends, family. I am here with co-author Miss Patasha Burston. You know who I am. I'm Ardene Garner, the visionary author, and Patasha Burston is one of the co-authors in the Stand Up Resilient Black women who are shaping the world with their faith anthology. And she's going to give us some of her time on today and tell us a little bit about her chapter and a little bit about what she does. So we're going to jump right into it, Miss Patasha. And I may refer to her affectionately as Lady P because that's how she's known in those clubhouse <laughs> streets. Just so y'all know, that's how she's known in those clubhouse streets. And that is where we met. So let's jump into it. Welcome. I'm so excited to be with you. This is so exciting. Yes, yes. So Miss Patasha, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you said yes to join the Stand Up Anthology. Well, I am Patasha Tyreen Burston, and I am one of the co-authors for Stand Up, this up-and-coming brilliant masterpiece that's going to be a bestseller across the nations. Outside of that, I am also a kingdom entrepreneur. I own several businesses. I own a all-natural skincare product line for men, women, and children. I also have a cooking and baking company called Kairos Kingdom Creations, where I take common desserts, common breakfast, lunch, dinner, and put a twist on it, and people have been going crazy. <laughs> and I also have a school called Overcomers University, where men and women and youth come, and they are trained and they are developed to take their lives back by force, whether it's they're struggling with addiction, if they're struggling in their marriage, if they're struggling with their self-esteem, we are actually in place to help them discover their true destiny and their purpose and to come out of those dry places. So I have a lot on my plate. I wear many different hats, including Clubhouse, where I have a soaking session room where we soak every morning in the presence of God at 6 a.m. And when I tell you it's been life changing, I'm, I'm just blown away. I'm just blown away. But uh, Patasha is really um, a woman who is just discovering who she really is. It took me a long time to get to this place. And when I met you on Clubhouse in your room, I was introduced to Clubhouse through a friend. And I'm not one for social media. <laughs> but I went in and um, connected with some people and I met you. I came into your room and what I heard was amazing. And my life has changed through your room which led me to coming in agreement with God because he's the one that put me in position to connect with you to write the chapter in your book when I heard about what, what your book was going to be about and knowing who you are 
as a woman, as an entrepreneur, I said, okay, I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to write this particular chapter because in actuality, I was supposed to write it prior to, but I guess God said, um, you're taking a little bit too long. <laughs> So I'm going to connect you with another daughter of mine who is on point. She moves when I tell her to move and you're going to collaborate with her and you're going to get this out. And so that's how it's been coming about. And ever since I wrote the chapter, um, again, my life has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like overnight things have been happening. Doors have been opening. People have been reaching out to me, asking questions about how to deal with certain issues. So it's been an amazing journey and I'm so glad I connected with you. I Listen, I'm so glad that we connected in the room because many of you may not know, but we connected on Clubhouse and Patasha is a prophetess. She didn't mention that, but she's a prophetess and she prophesied in my room and she delivered me literally, didn't know me from Adam or Eve, delivered me in my room. And the Lord asked me to ask her to do the opening prayer on a webinar. Yeah, this was a business webinar. He asked me to ask a prophet to do the opening prayer. And when I tell you this was not your typical webinar, I just thank God for the, the vessel that she is and how she serves. And so with all that you're doing, I'm just honored that you were able to fit this in your busy schedule because you are really saving lives. And so wow. I've been fortunate to read your chapter. So I'm going to continue with this interview so we can get into your chapter because it's going to blow your minds. I'm just telling you all, grab your notebooks and your pens if you don't have it already. She's going to set it on fire, even though this is just an interview. She's about to set it. Okay. <laughs> um, Patasha, so I've been telling all of the, the co-authors that the resilient Black women who are shaping the world um, with their faith is more than a book. It's a movement. What does that mean to you? When I heard uh, that it was a movement, I literally thought about women coming together that had been muzzled for so long. And because we came together and we decided to step out on faith and tell the world what we've been through and how we overcame, because we are overcomers, this book is literally going to set captives free. I truly believe in my heart and by the spirit of God that anyone that picks up the book and read the pages, I believe, I know that there's healing in the pages. Everybody is not going to go to church to get what they need. What they need. It's going to take something as simple as this brilliant masterpiece, this book, when they pick it up and they set their eyes on the words from each and every single author. There's something in this book for everybody. Yes. Not just women, but it's for men. It can even be for a teenager. Yes. But whoever sets their eyes on it and they read how women survived, overcame, broke through, busted out. I'm telling you, lives are going to be changed. Chains are going to drop off. People are going to get healed in their emotions, in their minds, in their spirits, in their bodies. It's a movement because God has breathed on the book. Jesus. Everybody is writing something, but it doesn't mean that it's a God thing. It could be a good thing, but it doesn't mean it's a God thing. But when God is the foundation of what we're building, he breathes on it, which means lives are going to be transformed. That's the movement. Movement means something that's stagnant automatically gets stirred up because it gets connected. So those that connect to the book, their spirit is going to be stirred up. They're going to be set on fire and lives are going to change. And that's what I feel the movement is about. It's more than just a bunch of stories. Right, right. There's healing and deliverance in this book. Right. And I'm I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Listen, you heard it first. God has breathed on this book and there's going to be healing and deliverance in, in every single 
chapter because I've had the privilege to read every single chapter. I promise you, there is something for everyone, just like you said. Oh, Jesus. Absolutely. It, it really is. So can you describe uh, for us, Patasha, your journey from ideation, thinking about writing your chapter to publication where you pressed submit to the publisher um, on your laptop? What were you thinking? What did you feel? What was your process like for you? I didn't want to do it. <laughs> to do it i did not want to do this i said lord you got me telling my business you got me opening up and just telling everybody what i went through i struggled with it even though i said yes to god mm -hmm. i struggled with it because it meant that i had to go back and dig up some stuff and so the tears came the hurt came the the pain came, but it wasn't, it didn't put me in a place where I was set back. Sometimes God will have you dig up some old bones. And if there's any meat left on it, it has to go. So while I was writing it, any residue that was in me from my past had mm. to go. Mm. So I'm sitting at my computer typing and all of a sudden I can feel Holy Spirit telling me I, I still need to deal with that right there. I know you're typing it out, but we're going to work it out. I still need to deal with you in some stuff. So as I'm writing, I'm getting delivered. But I'm also giving birth at the same time. Jesus. It's something when you're writing, getting healed, getting delivered but getting ready to give birth at the same time. Talk mm -hmm. about contractions in the spirit. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was feeling the contractions. It was like what was in me was kicking me in my ribs. But at the same time, God was healing me, letting me know you obeying me and writing it is bringing complete and total healing to your soul. So when I got to the final sentences, I, I read over it. And I said, Lord, th th this is a lot now, now, now don't have folk trying to kill me, please. <laughs> please don't have nobody call me and say, why did you write that? But one of the thing the Lord, he said, I need you to be completely and totally transparent. Don't sugarcoat anything. Say what I tell you to say, because this is what you went through. So why would you try to hide what you went through? How are people going to get healed if you don't tell the whole truth? Mm. The whole truth, so help you God, speak the truth. And so when I submitted it that night, I felt relief, but I still felt anxiety. I was like, oh my God, Arjuna is going to read this. Who else going to read it? What are they going to do when they edit it? Oh my God, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? Um, but I, I still felt that relief of, I finally did it. I finally accomplished this. I actually did it. And it was like, I felt like I ran a race and I won. Mm -hmm. And it, it just felt so, so good to finally complete such a major, major goal. To me, writing my chapter was a milestone in my life. Um, because again, I was supposed to write it, supposed to have written it a long time ago, and I didn't out of fear. So being a part of this helped me discover that I can do whatever God asked me to do. He gave me the strength. He gave me the perseverance. He gave me the tenacity. He gave me the authority Jeez. to write the story. So that was my experience. And, and I, I just, I pat myself on the back. I did a good job. <laughs> did an amazing job. I read the story. Y'all better get ready. Y'all better get your copy of the book and make sure you order it directly from Patasha. Get her John Hancock on it. Have her mail it out to you because when you read her chapter, which she's about to tell us now, the title of her chapter, you're going to be blown away, but you're going to be healed. And she will articulate the things that you may have been thinking and feeling in a certain place, 
but unable to say it or didn't know how to express it. So do us the honors, Patasha. Tell us what the title of your chapter is and share with us the significance of your title and what you hope your readers will walk away with after reading your story. Grab your notebooks and your pens. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, the title of this chapter um, is very significant for me and is called Freedom Looks Good on Me, The Day I Decapitated Jezebel. And when Holy Spirit gave me that title, I was blown out the water. I didn't see that one coming. I thought it was gonna be a nice little cute title wrapped up in the bow. <laughs> Oh my God. And he gave me the title. I said, Lord Jesus, I was looking for something else. He said, no, change that. That's not what we're calling it. That, that is real cute, but that is not the title. And so I had to change it to what he said. This particular chapter is, is, is very important to me because I'm 48 years old and I've been in church most of my life. And um, being in church for me was a very excruciating experience. I endured a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of discouragement. And I left the church for a season. I left God for a season because of things that were done to me by those that I trusted, leaders. And so all that I went through, the chapter surrounds what can a person do when they find themselves being a part of a ministry that's destroying their lives. The church is more than just a, a hospital. It is the place where you get trained to become a general. Mm. And so I found myself sitting under several leaders that discovered who I was in the spirit and tried to shut me down, shut me up, and it eventually kill me. And so the Lord let me know what I was coming up against and it's a spirit called Jezebel. There were other spirits, but Jezebel was the head. And Jezebel can operate out of a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And the main job of this spirit is to get the sheep, those that truly belong to God. Jezebel's job is to get them to abort what God has impregnated them with. Oof. And she does that by intimidation, lying and deception, manipulation, controlling them, trying to murder them, literally. She uses those closest to her to get to those that she's trying to destroy. And she really goes after prophets because the prophets are the mouthpiece of God. Mm -hmm. Prophets are the ones that speak truth. And Jezebel, because her father is Satan, she operates in deception. And when she hears truth, her job is to hurry up and shut, muzzle the mouth of the prophet. And if the prophet tries to come forth anyway, that's when she turns up the heat and starts sending out assignments through demons, witches, warlocks, sorcerers to literally kill the prophets. It's happening to this very day. So this chapter identifies what are you supposed to be looking for in a leader? How to identify when a leader is mistreating you, harming you, manipulating you, trying to shut you down, trying to constrict and control you. Mm. Jezebel wants nothing more than for true prophets, and I keep saying true for a reason, because there's a lot of folk out here calling themselves all kinds of stuff and they were not called by God, they're self-called. But those that have been called by God, Jezebel wants nothing more than to keep the prophets locked away in a cave. She don't want them seen or heard. 
They're only good enough to do certain things. You can clean my toilet. You can carry my briefcase. You can pour my water, but you cannot speak the word of God. And she's very competitive. She has a spirit of com uh, uh, competition on her. She sees what prophets are doing or what other people are doing and it irritates her. So she'll try to sabotage what God has placed inside of you. She'll try to duplicate it. She'll try to steal your baby. Instead of being, instead of that leader being a midwife and pushing you forward, they end up being a murderer. Mm, mm, mm. And so they'll try to murder what's inside of you. But murder is her last resort. If she can't get you to have a breech birth, if she can't get you to give birth ahead of time so that you'll miss the mark, or if she can't get you to miscarry, she'll go in by any means necessary and destroy what you're trying to build, what God has told you to build. Mm -mm -mm. And so I have experienced this on many different levels, under, under different ministries. And it's such a painful place to be in because what happens is people that experience, you know, the world, you, you know, the church calls it church hurt, but the Lord corrected me one day because I was talking to him about it. And he said, I need you to stop calling it church hurt. When you call it church hurt, you're talking about my bride. It wasn't the church that hurt you. It was the spirit that was operating through the vessel that was available to be used. Mm. And he said, but you don't go after the person, you go after the spirit. Which means you are not allowed to put your mouth on them. You're not allowed to, to go after them with your actions. You're, you're not allowed to, to inflict harm on them. And that's what got me in this place. Like, God, you, you see what they do to me. So why can't I retaliate? He said, no, if, 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 if I'm your father, if I'm the one that you say that you serve, I need to show you how to handle leaders that have misrepresented me and mm. have harmed you. And he said, your greatest weapon is forgiveness. Yes. And that threw me back because that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> keep it real. Keep it real. <laughs> I did not want to forgive. I said, so since you, since all of y'all did this, this is what I'm, I'm coming after you now. I'm going to get down on all for, when I'm done with you, you're going to swear you met Satan's daughter. That, that was my mindset, but God had to hurry up and get me because I had actually plotted and planned in my mind how to seek revenge mm -hmm. because I was on my deathbed. They left me for dead. And God had to deal with my heart. Mm -hmm. And I kept receiving, when I finally went back to church, I kept receiving these prophecies. You know, they, you know, people kept saying, uh, so-and-so left you for dead. And these were people that didn't even know me, had no idea where I came from. And they kept saying, but God said, forgive. God said, let them go. God said, walk away. God said, leave. And when you leave, this is what's going to happen. He's going to bless you. He's going to do this. And so God took me through a process of forgiveness. Mm. And it was not easy because I was, I was hurt. So he had to deal with all this stuff because when Jezebel shows up, when you experience spiritual rape and this, God calls it spiritual rape because it's a stripping that they do. If you read the story of Tamar in the Bible, she was stripped. She wasn't just entered in. The one that raped her didn't just enter in and take her innocence. He stripped her of her true identity. Wow. He made sure she was left barren, broken, depressed, oppressed, stressed out, anxious. And that's where I was. And that's what spiritual rape does. It strips you of who God said you were. It strips you of your joy, of your peace. It strips you of your identity. It strips you of learning 
uh, uh, allowing yourself to love again, allowing yourself to trust again. Jezebel does a work. She makes sure she takes everything from you. And that's where I was because I had been down for so long. I didn't trust anybody. I wouldn't allow anyone near me. I would not love. I wouldn't allow love to come in and I wouldn't give it. I was just walking around a bitter, angry, nasty, evil woman. Talk about an angry black woman. That was me. Mm. And anybody that crossed my path, I was determined to hurt them. And if you dared mention the Bible, if you mentioned church, we, we were going to have a fight because I had left God at that point because I, I just couldn't believe that he allowed all of this. But he corrected me and he said, I did not allow anything. He said, the mistakes that you made, which is the mistake that many believers make today, is that we connect to uh, churches that God did not send us to. We have a tendency to attach ourselves to places that were not orchestrated by God. Mm. You can't afford, we can't afford to connect with someone just because they preach good. Just because the choir sounds good, you can't, no, your, the word of God says that the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So because I stepped out based off of what other people said about these leaders and because of what I thought I knew about the leaders, I connected, not realizing that there are many leaders in the church that are in these leadership positions, but they have not been healed and delivered themselves. So what do we know? Hurting people hurt more people. Yep. So they only did what was done to them. They only did what they knew because they were not healed or delivered themselves. So they inflict pain on others. They're so used to being in control. They're so used being the in all and be all. They're so used to being God. <laughs> and when someone kicks against that, you're called a witch. You're called a, I can't tell you how many times I've been called a witch. I've been called a Jezebel. I've been called every name under the sun, except for the name that God gave me from birth. Mm. And I had to get through all of that. I had to get through all the lies that were told on me. My name was dragged through the mud. My name was ringing in the city of Philadelphia in ministries. People were being told, don't trust her. Don't talk to her. This is who she is. This is what she did when she was at this church. My name, I couldn't go anywhere without people saying something. And it broke me. And I was on my way out of here because I had enough. But God came in because he's such a loving God and because he's such a merciful God. He began dealing with me about me first because you cannot forgive another person until God deals with your heart. Mm -hmm. You cannot pray for the person that has hurt you if your heart is full of pain. You will pray a miss. You will pray a soulish prayer and your prayers won't get answered. So God dealt with me first. He let me know where I went wrong. My attitude, my heart, my disposition, my character. He began dealing with me. And, and it was a process. It was not overnight. And once he finished dealing with me, then I was able to pray for my enemies. And guess what? I found out that my enemies were not the people that hurt me. My enemies were the spirits that were operating through them. Mm, mm. That's a word. And that's where we miss it. We think the people are the enemies and they're not. They're not. It was the spirits that you, that's why he said, don't go after the people, go after the spirit. When you go in prayer, when you go into warfare, when you go into intercession, you pray against the spirit and you ask me to heal them, deliver them. And that's what I began to do. And because of my obedience to the spirit of God, and I allowed him to heal and deliver me first and then begin to pray, intercede. And I had to do some fasting as well because I had to die to this nasty flesh. 
And once I did that relationship, certain relationships were restored. But I also found out that there are certain relationships that God will fine tune, the relationship will change. It doesn't mean that I no longer like the person or I no longer love the person, but when God begins healing, he heals in many different ways. And I had to ask him, okay, now that this has happened, what do I do with this relationship? Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to handle this person? And each person, he told me exactly how to handle them. And the foundation for each relationship is love, agape. Not arrows, <laughs> agape love. If they ever call on you, Patasha, and they need you for something, I will show you how to respond. But you are not to hold anything against them. And so this chapter helps men and women identify the type of leadership that they are under, the type of leadership they need to look for, and if they are experiencing spiritual rape, how to get healed. Because we have a right to be free. There's no way in the world we should be connected to a church or a ministry, but yet we're in bondage. Mm. There's no way. There's no way. That's not the spirit of God. If you belong to a ministry where you can't move, you can't speak, you, you feel trapped, you feel, listen, I, I was in ministries where I dreaded going every Sunday. I didn't want to go. I, I would be in my bed crying scores of tears because I did not want to go. I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't want to be around the people because of what I saw and what I knew. And I knew it wasn't God. But God set me free. And the first time he told me that I was free, I didn't, I didn't move when he told me to move. And I paid a price for that. And I want to let people know, if God tells you that your time, your season is up at a ministry, please obey and leave. Do not stay past the time that God tells you because there is a serious price to pay when you disobey God. Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain yourself to anybody. God, how do I go to my leader? He may say, write them a letter. He may say, give them a phone call, but you better leave. Mm -hmm. You better leave. Because you don't see what I see. You don't know what I know. It's some stuff that I'm trying to protect you from. I got to move you. And so the woman that you see now is because I'm free. Then this was not always me. This was, I, I used to be depressed. I used to be stressed out. Come on now. I used to cry day and night. I used to murmur and complain. I used to dread going to church. Not anymore. I'm full of joy. I'm full of peace. I'm able to be who God has called me to be. And I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm under leaders that love me, yes. that nurture me, that push me forward. They don't let me tell God no about anything. They, they, listen, my leaders live in Maryland. They come all the way to Philadelphia just to check on me. I've never known a leader like that. Never. They call me throughout the week to ask me if I'm okay. They know who I am in the spirit. Mm. They support my businesses. I ain't got to ask them for nothing. They just do it. They keep me encouraged. They are always speaking life to me. Listen, I, I couldn't ask for a better leader. My apostle Lewis and my pastor Lewis, Jesus, God has blessed me so richly. And my pastor is also my business coach. <laughs> if it were not for her obeying the voice of God, my businesses would not, I wouldn't have even built them for real. I, I mean, She's so full of wisdom. And, and, and what's on them is on me because I'm connected to them. Mm -hmm. And they love 
The love that flows from them is amazing. They love. They love the way Christ loves. I've never experienced that before. Jesus. It's so pure. My former apostle, she was like that. She just, she just had nothing but love. She had nothing but love. Just full of love. You see them and you just, you just want to hug them and kiss them because they're, they're just full. They're overflowing with love. But what I appreciate the most is that God let me know that no matter what leader you sit under, don't look for perfection because it's not there. Right. It doesn't exist. They're human. They're human. You respect them, you honor them, and you keep it moving. But this chapter is going to save a lot of people because one of the things that I did is that I began communicating with other men and women that went through spiritual rape. And Arjuna, I had no idea how many believers sitting in church have been contemplating suicide, mm -mm. homicide. They want to kill their leaders because of what's happening. We're talking about physical abuse from the leader. We're talking about physical rape. We're talking about molesting the children. We're talking about witchcraft. And people say, oh, that's a cult. Call it what you want. But God says it's spiritual rape because if a person dares to say something about what has happened to them, they're made to feel like it's their fault. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're being told that, oh, you shouldn't have said anything. Um, touch not my prophet. Touch, touch not my anointed. Do my prophet no harm. Uh, act like it didn't happen. When it first happened to me, I was told, I was literally told by a leader. They didn't mean to do that, but don't tell anybody else. But they didn't mean to do that. This leader kissed me in my mouth. And I'm, I'm, I'm just a teenager at the time. This was the first time I experienced it. And they, the leaders just brushed it under the rug. Oh, they didn't mean it. If I'm a child, I'm 4'11", and you're 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", how did your lips meet mine? And you're telling me he didn't mean it? And then I went to another church, and the pastor, you know, was stroking my hand and wanted to sleep with me. And because I didn't, I was ridiculed and I was excommunicated because I told. I decided not to sweep it under the rug and I thought I could trust the leaders, but they, no, mm -mm, no, it was my fault. So it was my fault that this leader stroked my hand, sent me messages. I saved all the messages and showed it to the leader. And I was made, they told me, you misinterpreted what they said. It's in black and white. How did I misinterpret it? But this is what Jezebel will do. Mm -hmm. She'll try to make you think. You don't know what you're talking about. You crazy. You're misinterpreting everything. Ignore it and keep it moving. Don't tell anybody. And there's a lot of believers right now, right now as we speak, that are a part of ministries that they know they need to get out, but out of fear. And they've been told, like I've been told, if you leave, you're not going to be blessed. <laughs> if you leave, God is not going to do anything for you because your destiny is locked up in my belly. How? So you're God now. Okay, so you done took God's place. Help us, people. Help us, Lord. Help us. I, and But, but Arjuna, I believed it because that's the way I was groomed. I was groomed that if you leave a place, you're not, God is not going to bless you. I, I put these leaders where God was. And God said to me one day, he said, you have made your leaders your God. You serve them more than you serve me. 
Mm. But I was trained that if you serve your leader, you are serving God. Not, <laughs> no, no. And God said, they have become your God. You talk more to them than you do to me. Everything that you do is for them, but you never come into my presence. Mm. You never worship me. You never praise me. Everything, your money, everything that's connected to you, you do it for your leader. But you and I don't have a relationship. So how are you serving me? And he said, when I bring you out of this, I'm going to show you what a true leader looks like. They will have my heart beat. They will not hurt you. They're not perfect, but they will not deliberately hurt you. And so that's what this chapter is about. And I just want people to know, believers, if you find yourself in a place where you're hurting and there's no one that you can turn to where you are in the ministry that you are, the church that you are. If, if you're being manipulated, if you're being told something is going to happen to you, if you leave, if you're being verbally abused, mentally abused, emotionally abused, spiritually abused, financially stripped, they, they will tell you, you got to give them access to your bank account craziness like that in order to pay your tithes and offers, they it, it happens in so many different ways if they want to sleep with you it happens in so many different ways if they are trying to control your children it happens a lot leaders want to control they can't control you so they try to get to your children and all of a sudden your children are rebelling against you because of what they said. If you can't make any decisions on your own, you got to go through them before you make a decision about your own life. About your, you got to go to them concerning your marriage. And I'm not saying don't seek counsel. Absolutely. We seek wise, but is wise counsel, godly counsel but not you trying to control everything that I do, everywhere that I go, every person I connect with, I got to come to you first. No, it's not going to happen. My leaders, when the door opens, I let my apostle know, apostle, this is what it is. Here's the, the information, the email, whatever. He'll say, okay, I'm praying. Sometimes he'll, he'll say, let, let me pray about this. Let, let me let, let me, because he's sensing something. He's keen in the spirit. And he has said to me, you know what? Because you got so much on your plate, I need you to rest. I, I just, I, I need you to rest because you're going to burn yourself out. There's some other things that the Lord wants you to do. Every door that opens don't mean you're supposed to walk through it. That's right. Use wisdom, use wisdom. Patasha, use wisdom. And I obey that because I know he's seeing and he, that's why he's my leader. But he don't try to control. Absolutely not. So um, if you find yourself in this place where you're being harmed and you feel stuck, my greatest advice to you is to get in the face of God, number one, and have a conversation with him because he wants to hear your heart. He knows what's going on, but we're talking about relationship. We're talking about intimacy with the Lord. Have a conversation with him and then ask him to show you your way of escape. He will. Ask him to show you your way of escape. And he may simply say, today is your last day going there. Don't go back. You may be on your bed, you may be cooking, you may be shopping, and he'll say, I need you to write them a letter, or I need you to make a phone call and tell them your season is up. Thank them for everything that they did. Don't say anything nasty, nothing. Just make your exit. Exit stage right. <laughs> <laughs> and don't look back. Don't look back. 
And I'm going to tell you this because this is something that I struggled with. Depression will try to set in when you leave. The enemy will try to make you second guess. He will try to make you think you did not hear God correctly. This is why you don't want to tell folk what you're doing. This is between mm -hmm. you and God. Don't tell people what you get ready to do because folk that don't know what God has said to you mm. will try to get you to change your mind. And before you know it, you still in bondage because reality is people that have been in bondage for a long time, you know, that saying misery loves company. Someone that's in bondage wants other folk to be in bondage with them. So you can't go around saying, God told me to leave. Don't do that. If you don't, if they don't know your spirit and you don't know theirs, don't say nothing. This conversation is between you and God. Sweet. And if you need confirmation about whether or not if you should leave, ask God for confirmation. He'll give it to you quickly because he's not going to waste no time, especially if your life is in danger. Mm -hmm. He will bring the confirmation. He said, out of two or more mouths, I will confirm my word. Ask me and I'll tell you. So I challenge, you know, I encourage rather those of you that are in a dry place, a hurting place. If you have been uh, through, some people call it church hurt. I don't. If you've been through spiritual rape, it's time for you to get in the face of God. God, how, when? Get, get me out of this. This cannot be you. You're a loving God. You're a kind God. God would never put you in a place where you are being harmed. He would never do it. That's not the kind of God we serve. He doesn't put us in dark places where we can't breathe. We can't see. We can't move. Why would he put you in a place where you are in bondage when he came to set the captives free? He wants you free. And that's why my chapter is called Freedom Looks Good on Me. I've never looked so good, felt so good in my life. <laughs> I feel so good. And because of my obedience, so many doors have opened. It's just been blowing my mind. I'm talking about spiritually, not just naturally. I'm coming to find out who Patasha really is. You know, folk call me prophetess. Strange folk call me pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Them strange folk be calling me pastor. I'll be like, did you just say that? <laughs> but I'm finding out outside of ministry who I am. I'm starting to pay attention to life. Things that I never paid attention to before, all of a sudden is coming alive. The things that I used to take for granted, I don't take for granted anymore because I'm free. Amen. I sleep well at night. Amen. When God allows me to sleep. <laughs> I eat well. I'm taking care of my body. I'm taking care of my spirit, man. I'm feeding my spirit daily. And I'm drawing closer to God. God is just, he's still healing. He's still delivering me. Still doing it. He's still gutting me out. He's still growing me up. He's still maturing me. He's teaching me about obedience. Yes, he yes. reminds me every day obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Never mind what people are saying. What did I tell you to do? Don't put man above me. What did I tell you to do? Lord Jesus. I'm the one that holds your destiny. You're breathing my breath. I can take your breath in the blink of an eye if you disobey me. I'm your father and I only want the best for you. I'm only going to give you the best. We serve a great God yeah. and he has a smorgasbord of blessings waiting for us. Waiting. There are doors that are getting ready to open for us, that's going to blow our mind. We are in a season where doors are going to open that we didn't even ask for. Yes, Lord. Yes. All because of our obedience to God and because we allowed him to set us free. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's what the chapter is about. We'll stop right there because I can preach a whole sermon. <laughs> and you didn't ask me to do that. Well, listen, it's good. I told him to get ready. Get ready because I knew you was going to bring it. Oh, my goodness. So, so, so good. So we are about to wrap up, but I just have a couple of more questions and, and one of them, and I know you said you didn't want to do it, but what encouragement would you offer an inspiring nonfiction author who is contemplating joining an anthology? Just do it. Don't second guess it. Just do it because it's really not about you. When, when it's all said and done, what you, if you decide to join an anthology project, you got to look past yourself. Mm. It's about the lives that are going to be touched and changed because again, of your obedience, you got to take yourself out the picture. You are just the vehicle that God is using. You're just the vehicle. And everything that we go through is for somebody else. It's not for us. And so don't think, because if you think, you'll think yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. If God said it, get ready, get in position, get a lot, get in alignment, do it and watch God move on your behalf. Don't talk yourself out of it. And don't, don't ask the opinion of too many folk <laughs> mm, <laughs> because you'll, true. you'll end up finding coming in contact with a person that says, you know what? Well, maybe it's not your time to do it when God told you to. That's deep. The enemy knows that you don't want to do it. So he'll send you somebody that will tell you exactly what you want to hear. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't tell too many people. Don't, don't go around asking, you know, I could have gone to 50 people when I, when I connected with you. I could have said, you know what? I, I want to do it, but I don't want to do it. What do you think? And what do you think? Eventually, I would have ran into a person that would have said, well, Patasha, don't do it. Write your own book. Wait till next year. Wrong answer. <laughs> Wrong answer. That's why I didn't tell anybody. That's true. I just did it. I just did it because I knew I heard God. So if God is telling you to do something, just do it. Don't be like me and procrastinate. Don't do it. Because if you procrastinate, he's going to send you an argument. <laughs> he's going to send you an argument. He's going to send you in Clubhouse and you're going to meet Arjunay. And Arjunay is going to say, what did God say? <laughs> what did God tell you to do? <laughs> oh my goodness. I love you so much. Lord, this has been fun. It has been a blessing. As we wrap up in closing, um, Lady P, what are your final thoughts or final words of wisdom for the listening audience right here and right now? My final words is get ready for the harvest. Mm. Get ready for the harvest. We are in our harvest time. Yes, Lord. And I was teaching this the other day, and I, I, I just want to quickly break that down. Whatever you sowed in this season is what you're going to reap. If you sowed unbelief, doubt, fear, you're going to bring forth wind. But if you obey the spirit of God and you sow tangible seed, if you sowed into other people's lives, if you encouraged others, if you did what God told you to do, expect a harvest. Jesus. Expect the unexpected because we are unexpected champions. Mm. Expect the unexpected because we are unexpected champions. Those that didn't think we were going to make it, those that counted us out, those that said that you would never become anything. Jesus. All I can say is watch God. Mm. Watch God blow your mind and those that are around you. Folk going to start scratching their heads trying to figure out how did he and she get there? Mm. What happened? Jesus. How did it happen? And you're going to have to tell them the truth and say, if it had not been for the great I am, you wouldn't see what you're seeing right now. Yes, Lord. Get ready for your harvest. 
We only got a few more days before, a few more weeks before 2022. 2022 is the year that's going to set a lot of folk free. Thank you, Lord. While the world will be struggling, if believers obey the spirit of God, we're going to walk in the land flowing with milk and honey. There will be no struggle, but you got to stay in the face of God. You got to stay in the word of God. You got to saturate your spirit constantly. Keep your heart on the altar. Don't let anything into your heart that does not belong. Mm. Don't wither up and die in the winter time. This is the time that we need to store up and prepare because harvest time is coming. We're about to see something great. We ain't seen nothing yet. So just be encouraged and get ready. Empty out your closets, your drawers. <laughs> Because <laughs> the harvest, empty out the garage, empty out the den, empty, listen, empty out everything because the harvest is coming in abundance. Oh, Lord Jesus. I receive it. I receive Ooh. it. Thank you, God. I receive it. I'm ready to run upstairs and just throw everything <laughs> away. I receive that word. Thank you, Lady P. Thank you, Prophetess Patasha. Thank you so Amen. much. For Thank you. Yes. Just Thank being you. obedient, sharing your words of wisdom. Listen, y'all, if this didn't do it for you, I don't know what will. Make sure you purchase your copy of Stand Up Resilient Black Women Who Are Shaping the World with Their Faith next month on December 10th or December 11th. Make sure you get it. Request your copy from Patasha, make sure you have her sign it, but make sure you get it because you heard it here. This book is going to set you free. And it's not always about being inside the four walls of the church. God uses his vessels. And all of these authors have come forward with their truth and their transparency, transparency to help you heal and get delivered. And so Lady P, I just thank you. I, I love thank you. you. I appreciate you. And I'm so glad that freedom looks so good on you. Freedom looks so yes. good on you. Thank Amen. you. Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. A blessing. I love you, Arjane. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you and all that you are doing. I read when, when I get a chance, you know, I'll be all over the place and I'll, I'll catch a sneak preview of your post. And I'll be like, God, this girl is no joke. She is um, literally, you are doing some big, great, jimongous. I know that's not a word, jimongous things. And I'm just so honored. You, you keep me encouraged. We don't talk mm. as often, but you keep me encouraged. And I so appreciate how you support me. You supported my businesses. You just, I just love how you coach people, how you mentor your rooms, everything. And, and I just can't wait to see what else God is going to do for you and through you, not just for you, but your family. Because mm. what's on you is going to trickle down to your seed and your seed seed. Mm. You're building a legacy. You're building a legacy. You're building, you're building a legacy for the generations to come. But it had to start with you. Thank you. Jesus. So thank you for giving God a yes, a complete and total yes. Thank you. Lord. And I just anything you need me to do, I'm here. Thank you. And I love you. Thank you. I love you. I love you so much. And I will see you on the inside in our private resilient black women community. Thank you, Lady P. I love you and I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye.